Hi everyone, I'm Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education for the Davis Finney Foundation. And I am here today with a great group of people. We're all here to talk about young onset Parkinson's and I'm really excited to do this. We've had a lot of people contact us and want more information. So I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, I'm gonna have everybody introduce themselves and then talk about where how they're connected to the Davis Finney Foundation and uh, sort of their experience with Parkinson's. Okay, so um, Amy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Amy. I uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's about five years ago, coming up on my fifth year anniversary. At the time, I was 48 and I was working full time as a law professor in Philadelphia. And I also had a law firm on the side um, and I was and still am married. And at the time I was diagnosed, uh, my two daughters were in middle school. Um, it's five years later, I'm still working full time. I still teach full time and I still have my law firm. And I have uh, learned a lot of things about working well with PD, so I'm happy to share them. Excellent, great, thanks. Sydney. Oops, sorry. Now. Okay, there, there we go. We yep. Hi, I'm Cindy Donahue. I was diagnosed about 10 years ago. I've been symptomatic probably since I was about 42. I was diagnosed when I was 47. Um, at the time, I had a daughter in middle school and a son in high school, and then some older kids also that were out of the house. And um, I'm married, I'm still married, and my husband is a great support. Um, and that's, that's me. Okay, great. Thanks, Erin. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Erin Michael. I am currently 43. I was diagnosed two years ago at 42 or 41, actually. Sorry, my math is bad. Um, started out with just a, I guess it was more of a, my right arm wasn't working very well and I thought I had a pinched nerve and went to a couple of doctors and had that very panicked moment where they say, oh, you've got Parkinson's and you say, how can that be? Um, when I was diagnosed, I was a vice president of a sales organization, a very big sales organization. Um, so I did take a step back in my career and went to a director level uh, while I worked through the diagnosis, but I still work full time. Uh, and I am still in the sales field. So looking forward to helping out uh, everybody as I can. Thank you, glad to be here. Great, thanks, Erin. Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Kennedy. I write as Kathleen Kiddo. It's a nom de plume and I like to do characters for Parkinson's and I try to bring a little levity and joy and I do consultations with people that are really struggling with the non-motor symptoms and I write a lot because it's out of a sense of complete desperation and isolation. This disease is really rough. And the young onset just means that our needs are more immediate. And with women, I tend to focus on women's needs as well as the young onset. Um, they seem like they're ever changing, like we're all playing whack-a-mole. And so I love to have discussions with other parkies so that we can decide ways to live better. And that's exactly what Davis Finney does. So this is my favorite organization don't tell the others <laughs> so thank you thank you for having me here i'm delighted right. to participate thank you cat hi everybody i'm cat hill i am also very honored to be here i was diagnosed um, almost five years ago at the age of 48 and like many of you had symptoms quite a bit before that at the time, I was the director of a busy inner city midwifery service um, at a hospital in Portland. We were delivering between 60 and 80 babies a month in our practice. And um, I took a step back from work and actually retired early, predominantly for medical legal reasons. It, it's a high risk field and I was up doing lots and lots of call. Babies never seem to come in the middle of the day. Um, and uh, since then, I've sort of redefined myself and I do a lot of volunteer work. I'm writing, um, I'm married. We just celebrated our 30 year anniversary. We have three children, <laughs> yeah. Um, and at the time of diagnosis, I had two in college and one in high school. 
and um, uh, we've gotten very creative about how we finance things and uh, power on even though I am I'm on disability and but I consider myself retired so I still do some consulting and some writing and I am very happy to be here great thanks Kat all right Mark Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Coes, and uh, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, just uh, just about two years ago at the age of 46. Uh, it was one of those things that you never really thought something would happen. I felt like it was in the prime of my career, prime of my life, doing things I wanted to do, planning for the future, and um, it just kind of came as a shock. And But uh, what I found is I'm uh, not letting that stop me. Uh, taking steps to stay well, stay healthy, get involved, help in the community. Uh, and I feel now my future looks as bright as ever. So I'm looking forward to sharing with others my experiences and helping where I can because I feel that helps empower me if I can help empower others. So thank you for having me here today. Thanks, Mark. Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I know most of you. Uh, my name is Kevin Kwok, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been living with Parkinson's for about 11 years now. I've raised three kids, been divorced and relocated here to Boulder, Colorado to become more involved with the Davis Finney Foundation where I'm on their board for the last, I think it's been now four years now. Um, at the time when I was first diagnosed, I was a partner at this uh, executive search from Russell Reynolds. Um, and at that time, I was the, man, the managing director in charge of North American Life Science. So my job was to place CEOs and chief medical officers of biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies. That's what I did for a living. Um, at the time of diagnosis, I kept it quiet for about five years. But then I found, and the truth is, when I was first diagnosed, I actually didn't think it was such a big deal, right? There's a lot of denial going on. And so, you know, I, I had family members that had strokes and had ALS and brain cancer. So I thought Parkinson's was a walk to the park. Boy, was I wrong, right? And so five years into it, I had deep brain stimulation <clears throat> with one of our other board members at Stanford, Helen Brown T. Stewart. And it was for me just completely as I call it, uh, a buyback of life. I call it daylight savings time on steroids, right? <clears throat> so what I did was I completely retooled my life. My marriage was going south. You know, at that point in time, I, I retooled my life to become a, a patient advocate. And I was able to turn that patient advocacy actually into a paying job in the, in the biotech industry. So today what I do now is I talk to patients, hear their stories, and basically not just focus on neurology, but I realize that patients are all similar across the board. And so I tell everyone I've turned my hobby into a well-paid job. <laughs> and so part of all of that was relocating here to Boulder, which I moved last year with my girlfriend and we are now happy Boulder citizens living the good life, I should say. Still traveling, still working extensively. I, up until now, I was supposed to be in Munich today. Last week, I was, you know, two weeks ago, I was in Barcelona, traveling a lot, 11 years into diagnosis. So I'd like to be able to tell you that you can, with Parkinson's, still maintain a life still raise kids, still have relationships out there. And each one of those topics is its own hour in itself if you want to get into it, right? Yeah, we'll just get to scratch the surface a little bit today. Thanks, Kevin. My pleasure. Okay, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Lane. Um, I'm actually the oldie in the group because I've been doing this just in June will be 20 years. And, um, where I was diagnosed, my children were three, six, and nine. Now they're 29, 25, and 22. So it's been a long journey, but very interesting along the way. Um, I just try to help people as much as I can. And my saying is don't say you can't, 
say you can with a little more guidance and uh, patience. You can do anything you put your mind to. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Okay, Brian. I just unmuted you. You can go ahead. Yeah, great. Oh, great. Okay, this is Brian. Um, I'm coming here to you today from Tucson, Arizona, which is my new home, relatively new home. I was diagnosed um, 12 years ago when I was 41 years old, and that was just a couple of days before my son's second birthday. Um, and I was just getting started early in my career. I was just about to take um, the licensing exam for psychologists in, in California at that point in time. Um, so my diagnosis came as a real surprise to me. I had no expectation that, that this um, was coming my way. Um, I, was, I had some shoulder pain, which I thought was the result of moving because I moved relatively shortly before that from Ohio to, to California um, for a new job. And um, I was shocked to find out that this was a common symptom that um, leads to a diagnosis of Parkinson's or precedes diagnosis of Parkinson's. So um, I was able to work in my field in the University Counseling Center as a University Counseling Center psychologist for 10 years um, before I retired in the summer of 2018. Um, and that's when we made the choice to move here to Tucson, Arizona, where there's more of a community um, around Parkinson's than there was where I was living on the far north coast of California at that time. So, um, and I found these, uh, these various kinds of connections, whether through Facebook or or online conversations like this to be really my lifeblood um, when I started out in, in such a remote area, but even now continuing here in Tucson where there's a much larger community, um, connecting with, with younger folks has been a, more of a challenge for me and that, that I've relied on the technology really to do. Great. Okay, there's so many things I wanna talk about. Um, I think I, just to give you a, a sort of a roadmap of where we're going, I would love to talk about non-motor first, um, and then uh, relationships and employment, and then kids. So um, Heather, you really talked about how um, that's a big piece of what you talk about with people is the non-motor symptoms. Can you just give us a little bit about what that experience has been like for you? And what do you think is the best thing that's, um, that helps you help other people who are really struggling mm -hmm. with that piece? Um, just to channel a little Tim Hag here and talk about perseverance and resilience. And um, I, I do this thing where I hunt joy. I, I find ways every day to have something to look forward to because you know you're going to get kicked down. You know that we're, we're dealing with constant grief and loss. And so the most important thing for me to, that I keep repeating to people is that depression wants to get you alone and kill you. It's going to try to deplete more of your resources and it's a liar. It's gonna to try to corner you and isolate you. So this connection that Lori Mishley and many of the other people that work with a lot of Parkinson's patients talk about is so vital, which is why I'm grateful to organizations like DPF to keep us all connected, our online things. When I meet people that are a little older who don't fall into the young onset category and they don't use technology, I always try to persuade them to join Facebook or something because the support that I have received through like the WPC as an example and meeting people, you know, like Brian and Kevin and Kat and everything. This is all online. I mean, here we are. And all I did was put my little message in a bottle out there in the form of writing and someone saw it and said, I'm anxious too. I'm depressed too. I'm isolated too. What can I do? And the reason why so many people I feel are lonely is because we don't talk enough about mental health. We don't, in, in general, not just with Parkinson's, and we don't know enough about mental health. And so I think it's important to keep that conversation going because I want to take people and almost shake them and say, you're not great. Shake them. <laughs> like I need to shake anybody. Um, but I want I to shake them and say, you're not crazy. It's Parkinson's. We're being, we're being beat up every day by a disease that's going to take away your resources and your coping mechanisms. And the sleep deprivation alone will do that. So aside from all the physical things that we can put in place to help ourselves, we need to connect and keep talking about this. Drag this into the light and plop it down on the table. Let's talk about dopamine agonists and what happens when we take those. Let's not have shame about saying, I'm depressed. I've thought about suicide. I've thought this. I'm anxious beyond the norm. I don't think I can do this. And let's look at each other and say, yes, you can. 
watch me do it. I've been diagnosed for almost a decade now. And if I can do it, anybody can. I have no special qualifications. So that's kind of what I say to people. There's, there's no reason why I should be any different than anybody else. I'm not special. You know, we're all in this mud together. You know, so we've just got to keep hunting that joy. Find those things. Even if you're just dancing in your kitchen, you know, even if you're stuck in the chair for the day, there are things we can do. There's so much out there, you know, and, and, and keep it, keep awe, keep curiosity. That's where I go with people. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else? Yeah. Kat, do you have something to say? Part of what I noticed in my job was that I was called to do an incredible amount of multitasking. And, you know, I sort I was really losing the ability to do that. And I, and I think I was worried that I was sort of losing my mind. I was one of the younger people in our practice and um, I had a lot going on at home. I was caring for my mom who was dying of cancer. I had a kiddo with type one diabetes. You know, I, I, I wrote a lot of that off. And in retrospect, all of that was really Parkinson's sort of taking my ability to lose the ability to stay on the top of my game, managing multiple patients. And, and once I understood that and I gave myself some grace around it. So I want to say, let's hunt joy. Let's choose joy. Let's lay down those neural pathways. We can do this, but let's also acknowledge that there's some challenges that get, can get in our way. And, and we have to understand those and give some space around those and learn about our new way of being with Parkinson's and what maybe are our limits. It was really hard for me to say that I had any limits. You know, I'm female, <laughs> I'm the oldest of three kids. And uh, so I, th I think that, that honoring where people are and being able to say, we can, you can get to the other side of this, but let's, let's figure out what's going on and let's figure out what your new normal is. So I'm right there with you. Uh, Heather may hunt joy and I choose joy every day. So, so we are um, uh, of a like mind that way. And you can too, everybody can. So that's my two cents. Sydney, and then we'll go, then we'll go um, to Amy. Go ahead, Sydney. I'm going to go along with what Kat was saying is that I, I at the time, I was a um, literacy specialist in elementary school. Um, and then because of budget cuts, they kind of gave me a choice to either continue the job I was at or go back into the classroom, which I hadn't been in for 13 years. So I went back into the classroom thinking it would be okay, you know. And it was a disaster. It was a disaster. And it's all what I finally realized, I didn't know at the time, it was all about that multitasking, the stress. And I finally got to the point where I knew that if I didn't, if I, first I just took some time off. I took a medical leave, eventually retired. But I, I realized that if I didn't do, if I didn't do it on my own, it, I was going to land in the hospital because it was just too much. Um, you know, so just, a lot of people are still working and and if they can that's great if you can't you know don't don't beat yourself up too much but re redefine i had to redefine myself i was only barely 50 maybe 51 when i retired and so i had to find something else which of course i have through a lot of advocacy and and other things but stress was was huge so be careful with stress yeah um amy I am. Um, I agree with everything that everyone's been saying. I also, um, I was surprised to find in my own experience um, that I actually feel, I feel, I feel the moments of joy that I feel on the other end of this are so much greater than I used to feel. And I started looking at the, at the literature, at the research um, with regard to um, happiness and how a lot of the literature says that people have their own sort of space that they live in, in terms of gauging happiness. And when bad things happen to them, and even when good things happen to them, after it's over, they kind of settle back into that same space that they were before. Um, and so I also want to tell people that um, you can still settle into uh, a lot of happiness on the other side of this. And, um, 
you still manage what you used to manage before. Um, but it's not, it's not always dark. Right. It doesn't have to be always dark. Yeah. Right. Brian, did you have something you wanted to say? But, uh, yes, yes, I did. Just quickly, I, I found myself nodding my head a lot, at least internally, um, as I listened to what other folks were saying, especially about multitasking and stress. Stress is a poison for us, um, more than for most people, I think. But um, rather than echoing more things, I would just say, for me, a huge thing has been mindfulness, whether that's in formal or formal practices. Mindfulness is huge. And just with this recent coronavirus scare thing, it reminds me sort of to be present in this moment and to make the, make the most of this moment because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But um, if we escape into the past or the future, we lose this moment. And this moment is really all we have ever. Kevin. Yeah, you know, I first of all am just, you know, nodding my, my, my head with everyone's comments because you're all so spot on. Michael Kinsley wrote a really good book called um, Old Age Beginner's Guide. I don't know if any of you have read it, but he was a writer for um, Salon and the New Yorker. And at age 40, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's and with biting humor, he writes about his experiences. And what I love about him is, is his sarcasm. But one of the things he says is we are all sent as young onsets into the world of the elderly to learn something and report back what we found. And so what I'm hearing is that many of us have made love. I, I say we've done better than making lemons or lemonade out of lemons. We, we, we've made margaritas, right? <laughs> and through all of this, I think that there are people here that I've met, you know, that I've never would have met before, right? I mean, all the people on this call, the people of the foundation, and somehow I think some of us have turned what is a negative situation into something that's we probably would have done this with anything that we would have been diagnosed with along the way. But but I feel very lucky in some ways. I mean, we, we, we're not alone here. Someone else said that earlier. But we have the camaraderie of other people that are walking the walk with us. And to me, that, that that's so gratifying, is helping other people get out through all of this. That's one thing. And the second thing is destigmatizing this disease with people who don't have it. I think we owe that because, you know, I was medically trained, but my, my coverage of, of Parkinson's, you know, back in the day was three lectures, right? And, and that's all we got, right? So I would say that, we, you know, there's no wonder that people don't understand. Our doctors are just learning about it. It's evolving out. And, and, you know, the impatience that people give with us, it, it drives me to the, you know, no ends of the earth, the first frustration. But it's our job to kind of educate them and bring them along. Because one day, who knows, they're going to get touched by this. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Erin, were you going to say something about this? Yes, I was. Thank you very much. I agree with what everybody has said up till now, um, but I just wanted to add two different points of view. So when I was first diagnosed, just in my personal life, when my friends, family, coworkers would talk to me and have conversations and come to me with their problems in my head, I automatically went to, oh, they've got problems, but let them be me for a day. I've got problems. So for me, it was very critical to stop comparing myself to other people because I, other people do have problems. Their problems are still important and it's unhealthy to hold that in and you have to let go of things that don't matter and aren't going to change anything. And then the second point I was going to make is it's okay to not be happy all the time. So I've realized with myself personally, I've never been a super emotional person. I've never been that girl to cry at movies and everything, but with these pills now, sometimes I'll just cry at unexpected times and I had to become okay to know that it's okay to cry and to ask for help and tell people this I just want to cry for a day and not be okay and I'll be okay tomorrow so there is the flip side of that too I think you do have to allow yourself to process the whole spectrum of emotions that you're going to go through on this because it does change from day to day but the bottom line is it's a choice like everyone says you have to choose to pick yourself up and move on yeah and I think you made a really great point is that 
you know, you have to educate, not only do we have to educate people about what Parkinson's is, what is, how does it show up? How is it impacting people's lives? But, you know, educate them as to like, I need this right now. You can't fix this for me. I need you to be here. I need to be able to cry. I need to be really mad and really upset. And I need you to be that person for me. Um, and I think that can be difficult for people because they feel you're helpless. They feel helpless. They can't do anything. They know they can't do anything. Um, and I think as you educate them and say, no, this really is doing something for me. Like just that I have your support and that I'm free to do and cry and be upset um, is gonna help me. So that's great. Um, we kind of started talking a little bit about the employment thing, but I would love to hear from those of you who, um, like Amy in particular, you are still you know, working really hard 24 seven. Kevin, you're still working, Mark, everybody. Um, what, what was really important for you to do in your life to be able to do that. So a lot of the time what we're getting are questions from people that say, I'm terrified. I know that we don't have the funds for me not to work. I have to work, but I don't know how to do it. I, I don't know how to get the resources in place. I don't know how to work and also do this full-time job of living well and exercising and all of those things. So what can you, what can you share with them that was helpful to you as you were navigating this and are currently still doing that? Um, I, uh, I was diagnosed on a Friday afternoon and the first person I told on Monday morning was my boss. I'm lucky in that I work in higher education and I think that higher education sectors and the government sectors for the most part are a little bit friendlier to people who have, who manage chronic illness and disability in the workplace. Um, and my boss was very, uh, supportive and, and good in that that conversation, which happened two days after my diagnosis, changed everything for me. It made me feel like it was going to be okay. That's one thing. And I know not everybody has that kind of boss and that kind of opportunity in their employment. But the other thing is that uh, I walked into my classroom uh, the next day and I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. I didn't think I was going to be able to be on full display. I, I physically I didn't feel any different than I felt the last time I saw my students, but emotionally I felt like a completely different person. And I told my husband, I don't, I don't think I can do this. I, I just don't think I can be so in front of everybody as my condition deteriorates. And uh, about 10 minutes into that class, and I, it was really hard to walk into that classroom, but um, about 10 minutes in, I realized this is really helpful. I love coming to work. It's actually really therapeutic for me. And, and uh, that mindset, I think, has been really helpful. For people who feel terrified, uh, I would say to them that the best thing to do is to, is to educate yourself on your rights in the workplace and, um, and ways, reasons that you might want to disclose or not disclose. There's lots of factors that go into that kind of decision and everybody's situation is different. Um, I was able to disclose really early because of my situation. Not everybody's able to do that. When I have, when, what I found when I disclosed was that there was an enormous amount of stress lifted off of me just by other people knowing. And um, the way, I think the best place to self-educate is um, the Department of Labor actually has a really great website. It's very informative. And there's an organization that's, that's uh, funded by the Department of Labor called Ask Jan, uh, askjan.org. I don't know if you guys know about it, but they are people who've been working in the disability area for over 20 years and they answer all your questions very, it's all confidential and it's all free and they can really help you in deciding whether to disclose and what kind of things you can ask for and what kind of things that you shouldn't ask for. That's one thing. And then the second thing really quickly is um, just find other people who, who are on this journey ahead of you, which is what I did right away. Someone introduced me to somebody who was 10 years into their PD journey and in a similar situation as me. And I had lunch with that person and I came home from that lunch and I told my husband, I'm going to be okay. This is going to be okay. I have a lot more to talk about about that, but I'll just, I'll turn it over. That's great. Kevin or, or Mark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Amy, your journey sounds very similar to mine in some regards. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I was hesitant to tell my work and I, I went out and talked to a variety of different people, like, should I tell them? And I got a lot of conflicting information, you know, CEOs of other companies, I was friends with said, don't tell them you have rights, you know, you don't want to disclose this to individuals that said you really need to. 
to have a conversation. And it was through a conversation I had with one of the ambassadors when I was first early diagnosed that really convinced me to have that conversation. And, and when I did, it took me a while, but when I did start to tell, you know, my, my immediate uh, manager, my team, I felt I was lifted, right? This burden was lifted off of me and I felt I could really be myself at work. Uh, and, and it helped explain to them why I was leaving at certain times of the day to go to exercise, why I had doctor's appointments versus hiding private, calen- private appointments on my calendar. I could let people know this is what I was doing and why I was doing it. Uh, so it was really uplifting. The other part that Amy mentioned I kind of want to tag on to is finding people like you in your organization. I, I don't know one person in my organization diagnosed with Parkinson's, but I now know a bunch of people that are dealing with different disabilities and challenges in their life through an employee resource group that we have. And they, they, they have really kind of helped me, even though they're dealing with different struggles than I'm dealing with, but it helps, it helps when you're around similar people that are dealing with similar challenges, it kind of helps you kind of see the, see the, uh, see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And then there's others that are around you that can help you and help each other. So it becomes kind of this, unspoken support group. But again, that every, every culture, every organization is different. And I think it's important for you to take read on that and feel comfortable with what, uh, what, what you're disclosing, what you're sharing. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, I... Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. So my experience was a little bit different. Um, you know, m- m- I was a, a partner in an executive search firm and you were only, you know, rewarded based on what you did yesterday. So I was actually quite apprehensive in the beginning to say anything. And frankly, I was so mild at that point in time that I functioned in a world where I thought I was fooling everyone. And I would send people ahead to meetings and then I would meet them there so they wouldn't see me walk, you know, in the hallways or on the streets of New York to those meetings. But you know what I realized was as Parkinson's, the journey continues, you get, you get worse. There's just no two ways about it. And the stress of not becoming open actually made it worse. And so it wasn't until I was selected for deep brain stimulation that I had to take a leave of absence that I actually openly come out and tell everyone, including the partners, you know, the, the head partners of the firm. And I thought maybe they would greet me with this great benevolence. But instead, what they said to me was, Kevin, this is our old model. And, you know, we cannot cannot customize the culture just for you. And so I had to go through what I call the mindful pivot at that point in time and actually think about, well, well, I can either be part of this culture and fight it or I can go outside. So that's when I actually joined one of my clients and did internal recruiting and was able to then use that to leverage this whole patient advocacy side. So it was a series of journeys where I was able to reduce the stress load at work by leaving the old culture and then convincing the the new company that this was a need. Uh, And and I I just think it's that reinvention that we've got to figure out right. Not every, not every company or culture can be benevolent to people that have disabilities. And so you've got to figure out, well, either I've got to be stay with it or fight it or move on. And I chose to move on. Right. Thank you. One of the things that a couple of you have mentioned, and I just want to clarify for, you know, there's some people that have been, uh, they're young onset and they're also newly diagnosed and uh, we say things and we just know what we mean but they don't so when you say when i feel stressed it gets worse what what are you saying specifically is your you know is your motor symptom getting worse is your sleep getting like what are those things that people that might be newly diagnosed and are young can say oh okay i didn't realize this was a thing cat What I will say is that I felt so rotten by the time I left work. I was incredibly sleep deprived and tremory and internal tremor and anxious. And I didn't know I could feel better until I slept for about eight weeks on my couch and did virtually nothing. And what I found was that my 
motor symptoms got better as I felt less stress, more mindful, more rested. My um, anxiety symptoms were better once I had had a pace that was a little bit more reasonable when I wasn't expecting superhuman feats from myself. Um, and since then, as I've had, there's always opportunity for stress, whether you're in the workplace or not. If I'm in a situation where there's a, prolong, pro, uh, a prolonged period of demand, I get more symptomatic. And so um, for people that are newly diagnosed, they may not know that they can feel better rested and less stressed until you give yourself some space to learn what that feels like. Um, and so I would encourage anybody that's newly diagnosed to try to do that in their world, whether it's taking a leave of absence or slowing down or just going to work and not adding on all the extra things, if you possibly can, to see if you can help yourself mitigate some of the symptoms that you're having and maximize how you're feeling. And we all know exercise also is an integral part of that. Um, and that can be, be challenging how to fit that into an already uh, uh, full schedule. But for me, it took some time to sort out what was Parkinson's and what was um, stress and, and how those two interfaced. And it took me quite a bit of time to figure that out. There's not a manual for it. And, um, and so, so give yourself some grace around navigating that if you can, those that are newly diagnosed. Thanks, Kat. Amy. And then Heather, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, but really quickly, that's exactly right, what Kat said. And, and um, it's really scary at first because this is a day-to-day -day illness. Some days you feel horrible and you think, this is how I'm gonna feel for the rest of my life. And it, for the most part, early onset, that's not true. And I have a set of three women, we all have this group text and invariably one of us is having one of the terrible days we text to each other and the other two say, this is temporary, it's temporary, it'll be over tomorrow. And it always is. And I think that's really important. And even though intellectually we know that this, this is just, it's temporary, um, having, that, having that group of support um, to tell you that when you need it is really helpful. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Heather. I echo what Amy said about having a touchstone we all need our touchstones, whatever that means for us. And that's one thing that I was gonna say about the, the newly diagnosed. But if I may just double back very quickly about work and workspace, aside from your basic needs being met, you know, the money in the family and, and earning a living and, and having you know, a home, um, I think it's really, really, it is, it's absolutely vital that you focus on the fact that you are needed in your position. You have a purpose. You can't worry so much about how you are perceived as I, as I believe I have something to offer. And that supersedes any uh, reputation or concern over, over my own demise or how I will be received by others, in particular the community that doesn't understand Parkinson's. It's a very complex condition. And just like um, Amy and many have, have echoed and Kat about having grace around coming as you are, you know, we're going to be off sometimes, we're going to be on sometimes, and we're going to want to look up at the gen pop and say, oh, here's what's happening with me. I'm just, I'm a parky, you know, you come to a place where it's, it's less important that you communicate that than I have a purpose here. I want to push this purpose through. That is my goal. Um, but also you asked about, um, you were talking about, um, Come, uh, Kat also mentioned, and I loved this, about slowing down and resting. However, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie and I have total ADD and I really like being stimulated. And I also believe that I'm dying faster because we've been dealt a really crap hand. So I want to fit it all in, fit it all in, fit it all in, and then burn out. So as you get older and more mature with this Parkinson's, I hate to use those words like more mature with Parkinson's, whatever, you realize you absolutely have to find that balance for you, whatever that means for you. I like the idea of eating the frog first. It's a terrible expression, a French expression, but you, you know, you take care of the stuff that's really difficult when you have the most energy and get it out of the way then you have to make space to do stuff just for you. You got to feed yourself, you know, you need those nutrients of all sorts, not just food. You, you got to feed yourself. So that's, I think what I meant about hunting joy, but definitely coming as you are 
and then also finding that purpose part, the peace in the workplace, you are vital, you are needed, you are necessary. And this disease does not take that part from you. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thanks. Erin. Yep, just two things to add on to the work just based on my particular experience. The first thing is I've worked in big companies, small companies. Um, it's interesting how much these organizations don't realize what they are and are not allowed to say if you do tell them anything. You'll hear in meetings, how would that person know I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's? I didn't tell them. So you have to do a re-education as to, hey, that's not really how you should operate. There's confidentiality based on what I'm saying. So you have to be ready to take some of those items into your own hands and be able to confront situations to make sure everybody's following the guidelines that are your right as an American citizen or a citizen of other nations as well. Um, the second thing is when I was first diagnosed, I was rather surprised how much my HR team did not know about Parkinson's. So when I first went in and started asking questions about, you know, disability, is this covered? Is that not covered? You know, can I be approved for additional physical therapy sessions under my insurance because it's recommended that I take it? They didn't know anything. And I'm like, how can you not know anything? So you have to be ready to manage your own destiny a little bit and not want to wait for somebody to figure things out for you because you're going to be waiting a long time. Get the, get the information in your hands, know who to call for your insurance. If you get rejected initially, call yourself, explain the situation. Because I have found personally, I'm covered for a lot more than the basic plans are because of the situation that I'm in. So that's just great. Be that's great. Just be ready to be your own advocate and not be afraid to check people when they're being inappropriate in the workplace. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you and you have the opportunity at this stage to change things for people that come next, right? So um, all those, all the advocacy that all of you guys do all of the time, just by the nature of being on this call, I know that that's what you're doing. Um, you have so many different places where you can advocate and, and workplace is definitely one of them. Um, we have a little bit of time. I really want to get into the, the family and the kids and relationships. You know, what what were some of your experiences when you found out and you like Michelle, you had very young kids. What, what did you do? How did you guys manage that? What was, what was your game plan and, and what were some of the challenges that you faced? Um, there was no game plan. I can tell you that <laughs> it was just uh, talking to them one-on-one -on -one, you know, as they grew older and um, explaining, you know, that mom's hands are shake. My oldest would, walk in, he'd hold my hand so it would stop shaking. My middle son would say, I'm going to be a, a scientist when I grow up and make something that, that stops your hand from shaking. And my daughter would, uh, I'm sorry, would just say, why is that fair? You know, my brother saw you before you were shaking. Why can't I you know, see that? So it was just very emotional time to and the doctor helped. We had a fabulous doctor who spoke to them one-on-one -on -one also, and he would call them and speak with them at different times to check on me through their eyes. That's amazing. That really is an amazing doctor. <laughs> yes, he passed away uh, October 13th, the day after I walked last year. Uh, wow. Yeah, so you guys just kind of dealt with it as they were able to understand as they got older and could kind of understand right. what you could do and um, what you couldn't do. And, and then with dyskinesia, you know, it was bad before DVS. You know, my middle son would, would want me to come to school because it was embarrassing. Oh, yeah. That's, it's hard. That's hard for, for young kids, right? I mean, it's hard as an adult. <laughs> to get it and have to deal with it all. So as a young kid, just trying to understand uh, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right, and yeah, being 32 when I was first diagnosed, 28 when the symptoms came, you know, came upon, it's just been here my whole life. Yeah. Please. Kevin, were you gonna say something? Yeah, you know, I'm probably an example where the relationships didn't work out very well. And I, and I have to hold myself responsible for that because, you know, the double-edged sword that we have of telling people we're doing all right, we're doing fine, we're out there exercising and doing things of what we think are superhuman strength and we think of us as ourselves as superheroes. 
And so your family feels like you're, you're okay, dad, you know? And what happens is sometimes even my own ex-wife would say that you don't need a caregiver, you're totally fine at this stage. Um, and so th that's the double-edged sword of, of, of telling everyone you're doing fine when in fact, some days you have good days and bad days. And, and playing poker face to them, you know, I, I think is a real problem for some of us. Yeah. I'm How curious if others have that same issue. Um, the most painful and devastating part of this disease is how I've affected others. And specifically in times when I haven't managed this disease well. And before I knew about the depression aspect, and it's hard to be around someone who's depressed a lot. It's not our fault. You know, there's no shame in any of this, but I have, I've uh, made some disasters and my kids have really suffered. Um, my daughter didn't know if I could get her to school. So I had to put my daughter in an Uber, you know, and uh, that's really painful to admit our disabilities um, before the medications kicked in in the mornings or whenever, and to know that that will be increasing and have to make amends for that. And I'm constantly apologizing to my kids. It's so painful. I really relate to what Michelle said and, and everybody said. And um, you know, we all have people that relied on us and our relationships, it affects everyone. It just wipes us out. So the best we can do for the world, for the people around us, for those we love is to really take care of ourselves. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Mark? You know, I was just relating to what Kevin was saying. I think, you know, for a lot of us, we are, you know, the, the rocks of our family at times, or, or were, right? So for now, for that to change, you have to rely on others, and sometimes that's difficult. So I think it's just, I think a lot of people say it's just important to be honest with yourself, be honest with your family. So as you walk, work through these things, you know, they understand what you're going through. You're not, Kevin, you the word poker face is perfect, right? We try to put on this facade that everything's okay. We got it under control. But if we don't allow ourselves to open up and have the conversations uh, with our family members, with our doctors, with our friends, with our coworkers, they don't know what we're going through. So it's, uh, it, for, for me, it's very difficult at times, you know, to, to open up to my family, to my daughter who's 15, to share with her what's going on. It can be right. difficult, but, it, but we need to give them the opportunity to kind of have that two-way dialogue with us. Yeah. Anyone else want to share anything about their family and relationships and, and some of their experiences? Yeah, yeah, I would. I would. This Great. is Brian. Um, so as I said earlier, my son was not quite two years old when, he, when I was diagnosed. So he's never known me really without Parkinson's. I mean, who knows how long I had Parkinson's before I was diagnosed, too, for that matter. So, but, but as long as he's been aware, I've been aware that I have Parkinson's. And I would just echo what, well, not just, but I would really want to underline what Mark is saying about the difficulty of being frank and open about some of these things. But that's so essential. No one can meet us where we are. No one can help us. We can't help anyone else if we're not open and honest about these things. And that doesn't mean... You broadcast it to everybody in every circumstance. Um, you, you need to be ju judicious, but if you're hiding it from people who are who are close to you, um, you're really isolating yourself in a really dramatic and, and um, painful way for you and for them. They, they, they were, they're going to want to know. I mean, and so so I mentioned my son's age of two because we've always been honest with him. If you ever had any questions. Honesty is the best policy. That's such a cliche, but if you had any questions, that doesn't mean we try to explain everything, but at an age appropriate level. So I remember having conversations with him when he was three or four years old about my, my symptoms and it continues now. And he's probably in the other room listening to me right now as I'm speaking. So yeah. and that's okay. That's cool with me. Yeah. And I think, you know, people, people want to know people that love you, and that are with you and spending their time, they want to know because they, they want to be able to help, right? They, there is, um, there's reciprocity and whether it's Parkinson's you're dealing with or something else that we're dealing with, right. um, being needed and needing somebody is, is part of being in a relationship. And if they right. don't know, and they're just hoping to read your mind, then, 
um, that can cause friction, right? And um, that's that's not great either. So uh, sometimes it's like that desire to be stoic and I got this and don't worry um, backfires in, in a completely different way where that person's like, I, I don't really care about that. I just care about right. how can I help you? I care about you, that you don't have to be Superman for me, so. Yes, and they're gonna they're gonna be confused if they don't understand what's if they see the symptoms and you haven't explained it. They're gonna, right? they're gonna they're, know the all they're doing is then creating a story in their own mind. It's fear, fear, story fear. that I've created that like wow I think I think that person thinks that I'm crazy whatever it is and yeah. um, it has nothing to do with it. It's just because they they don't know they don't know. Amy, were you gonna say something? Really quick, I just um, I think parenting is hard. Period, and whether you have a PD or not. And so what someone told me right, right, right away was not everything is Parkinson's go a little easy on yourself. You can have these conversations with your kids. I have two teenagers and I, you know, I think you just need to go easy on yourself and don't blame it all on yourself and, and your condition. Teenagers are tough too. They're tough. And oh, Sydney, go ahead. I got you. You're unmuted. We can't hear you. I'm mute. There we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry. So I think when I when I was diagnosed, it was kind of in between. I didn't have young kids. I had teenagers and young adult kids, and so my kids had seen me be, you know for lack of a better term, a regular mom or a normal mom or, or whatever you want to call it. And the, before there was any real information about those dopamine agonists, I was on dopamine agonists and I was kind of crazy. And so, you know, my kids had this normal mom and then this crazy mom. And afterwards I realized I feel like I'm going back all the time trying to apologize for that. And, you know, so it's, it's just tricky because you, whether your kids are little or, you know, like me, they were kind of transitioning or, or maybe they're older, you're, you're going to have different, you're going to have different challenges in each of those stages. But again, it is kind of hard. It's like Kevin says, a double-edged sword. You just don't know what's too much, what's not enough. I find myself struggling with that all the time. So, right. Great. Well, um, this hour went by crazy fast. I wish we had so much more time to talk about it, but I do want to do one more thing. Um, I want to go around the, the circle, this, the grid, and I want, I'm going to ask one question. I just want you to give me a one word, two word answer at most. What is the most important thing you do every day to live well with Parkinson's? And tomorrow you might have a different answer, but what is the first answer that comes into your head today? Um, and it's kind of like your favorite thing and also, you know, a little word of wisdom for, for some of the people who are watching. So, all right, Sydney, what do you, what's the number one thing you do? Um, exercise and I think like Kathleen said, or Heather, sorry, um, find joy. Find joy. Great. Aaron. I'd say exercise as well and just remaining hopeful. Right. Mark. Continue the theme of exercise and optimism. Cat. It's easy for me. Choose joy. I have it tattooed on my wrist. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> if I forget, it's right there. <laughs> Heather. Hope you're muted. There you go. Still muted. Still muted. If I could talk to my old self and, and myself that was newly diagnosed, I would say stay curious and stay in awe. That's you know? awesome. Just look out outside all the time. Great. Yeah. Michelle. Uh, volunteering and expressing to others to stay positive, to not look into the future, enjoy each day as it comes. Excellent. Brian. Stay present. Great. I'm sorry. I mean, we missed the first one. You were muted. What is the first one? Stay present. That's all I okay. said. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Kevin. 
smile at the sunrise. Right. Amy. Everything that everyone else said and also full engagement with the world, just full engagement. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Thank you all so much. I can't wait to share this with our community. It's going to be super great. And I'm going to have, I really want to do a lot more of these for people with young onset. So hopefully we can meet again very soon. Thank you, Mel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.